Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of the Nobel Minds Playlist, part of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination's Into the Impossible podcast. I'm your host, Brian Keating. And uh, today's episode features uh, Carl Weinman, who won the Nobel Prize uh, over a decade ago. And this uh, Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery and pro properties of strange uh, quantum materials called Bose-Einstein concepts and their applications and, and, and bizarre properties that they, uh, that they entail. Uh, but this podcast isn't about the discovery uh, for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize. Instead, it's about uh, pedagogy, because what Carl's done is turned his considerable attention towards improving physics pedagogy at Stanford and elsewhere. And this the discussion that we have really uh, was, was eye-opening, but also a delight for me to participate in, because of Carl's really um, wonderful way of looking at the obligations of an educator and how this rule that you know is always kicked around 10,000 hours rule that Malcolm Gladwell popularized um, and others have written about um, that this uh, that this rule really doesn't necessarily apply as much as we think it does and and how we can use uh, the actual pedagogical tools that physics is uniquely uh, capable of, of, of applying to better the outcomes, both for physicists, but also for society as a whole. We spoke about pedagogy in physics, but also in aviation. I mentioned him on skill and training. This was recorded a year or two ago, uh, and we're just getting around now to putting it out on the, on the YouTube channel. But uh, we talked about my exploits into getting a, a certification to become a flight instructor, and uh, how unique an experience that has, and sort of the weightiness of of teaching people how to fly when they could injure somebody else and perhaps do damage uh, to, to themselves and other people, uh, and maybe less directly impactful education, no pun intended, uh, in the world of physics, but where there are commonalities and how we can improve the outcomes by improving the teachers, not just the students. And we spoke a lot about uh, you know, his impression of current university professors, I'm not gonna name anyone's colleagues, uh, that would be okay. Uh, but he believes that, you know, the modern day university professor is not that far off from sort of bloodletting uh, for physicians in the 1800s and leeches and phrenology. So it's clear to me that Carl thinks incredibly deeply about the biggest issues of pedagogy, he takes this incredibly seriously. And uh, I love the way that he speaks about, as you'll hear, how you need to be well-rounded. We brought this example of Picasso being a role model to a uh, long dead role model for students of art and his opinion on how that can possibly translate into understandings for improving our outcome as educators, but even as lay people interested in, um, in, in communicating the highest possible topics. And we're all educators, we're all leaders, and we talked a little bit about leadership and what makes a good leader in this episode as well. So I hope you'll enjoy it. Please uh, subscribe, like, comment, review, rate, whatever. Uh, it really helps us out and we're gonna have a lot more no go minds on this podcast. And let me know some suggestions of who you'd like to see in the comments below. Thank you very much. Now, enjoy this episode featuring Carl Wyman, Nobel Prize winner, Into the Impossible Podcast. Just for the audio, I always like to ask people if you were, uh, somebody comes up to you and says, I've got good news for you and bad news, which do you want to hear first? Mm -hmm. The good news or the bad news? <laughs> Are you asking? I'm asking you, yes. Oh, uh, I'm not sure I have any bad news for you. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying if somebody tells you, I have good news for you and bad news for you, which okay. do you want to hear first? I want to hear the bad news. You want to hear the bad news. Okay. That's, I've kind of gotten 50-50. I had Freeman Dyson on last last month, and he said he wants to hear the good news because that will uh, soften the blow of any bad news that would come later. <laughs> well, I mean, partly this actually is, is governed by my work in education. Oh, really? Yeah, where it turns out negative feedback is much more useful for learning, contributes much more to learning than positive feedback. Right, right. <laughs> so, so, you know, to the extent bad news <laughs> is negative feedback, 
<laughs> you gotta get the course card. Actually, so it just dovetails dovetails nicely into what I uh, the question I was dying to ask you yesterday. But you're uh, thronged by so many uh, interesting students. I think that was the thing I liked that the students were asking your questions about pedagogy um, and your talk yesterday about you know how do you really turn non experts into experts. Uh, so I'm one of my hobbies in my copious amounts of spare time is I'm working on my uh, certified flight instructor rating. So I've got a commercial pilot's license. I've got all sorts of experience. But one thing my original flight instructor told me 25 years ago is never stop learning because once you stop learning, you get complacent. Once you get complacent, bad things happen. And so I started uh, to this process of getting my government-issued, FAA-issued flight instructor license. And to do that, you have to uh, study a great deal of human psychology. And I thought it was interesting. I think it's probably the only, you know, I can't imagine the IRS has, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, that, that the auditors need to know about or, or something like that. But it, it, it dawned on me that, you know, I've been a professor for 14 years uh, and no one ever taught me how to teach. And more than that, nobody ever, ever taught me, you know, these basic principles, hierarchical structure of needs, whether you agree with it or not. I'm, I'd be interested to hear, first of all, your take on, is that a legitimate thing? in the eyes of, you know, in social sciences, they seem to really cling to it. And the fact that the FAA, you know, seems to want to prevent people from dying. And so they feel like this is an important thing. You know, they have the pyramid of, of needs right in their handbook for flight instructors um, alongside, you know, how to land an airplane on a, you know, single engine that only is a two engine airplane. So what, what are your thoughts on, on, on the kind of the classical modalities of pedagogy? And is, is there a reason that we should or should not be teaching physics instructors how to be professors yeah. on day one. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it's very clear now that, yeah, if, if you want them to be good teachers, there's a there's a level of, of expertise in that. In, you know, to be a good teacher, you have to have the, kind of the expertise just like you do to be a flight instructor. Mm -hmm. And that means that you have to know about... The, the research on basic learning and connects with some, some basic cognitive psychology aspects. And you've got to know about how to implement those things properly in the classroom for the different ranges of students you have. And, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, and certainly in the previous thousand years, which universities are running, yeah. one didn't have that research to show. So, you know, it was kind of, there wasn't anything clearly to learn. It was kind of right. an individual art form. <laughs> and the, the trouble is we haven't, historically, we haven't gotten past that. Yeah. Because you know, we're just in that transition region. So I, I you know, like the, a pretty good analogy is to think about medicine. Mm -hmm. So we're at the place medicine was in about the mid to late 1800s. Where, <laughs> Leeches and where, phrenology. Yeah, well, yeah, before then, you know, it was kind of every crazy idea that somebody came along and <laughs> declared themselves to be a doctor. Right. And, you know, that was all it took. And then, but then you had this kind of scientific medicine coming along and, and that, but you still had the people practicing cookies, you know, their own individual idiosyncratic stuff at the time you had real science saying, no, there's better ways to do this. So my, you know, soundbite on this is that, you know, the, the standard university professor is is currently still practicing the pedagogical equivalent of bloodletting. <laughs> We there are antibiotics out That's there. Right. They know. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a problem of education. I mean, uh, the, like, the first university was in you know eight, 1088. And back then, I always point out, although I don't do it to my students, when the students were unhappy with the professors, the students would go on strike and the professors wouldn't get paid. Right. <laughs> Thankfully, that barbaric <laughs> process has been replaced by tenure. Well, <laughs> they, no, they brought us charge the students up front. That's right. Yeah, we, that's true. Yeah. we charge them for the wonderful education to come. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I feel like just having learned a little bit, and I had never encountered, I'd heard of that from my social scientific friends, but, but I never really encountered, well, you know, a student needs to feel, you know, a safe sense of security and physical safety and all those things. And we can assume, to the, for the most part, a lot of that's in place. But then, you know, a sense of purpose and meaning and progress, and, and, and you touch upon this in your talk. Um, but, I, you know, what I took away from your talk is this, is this, is this concept which... 
you know, I believe is, is attributed not to Malcolm Gladwell, though I think he made it famous as 10,000 hour rule, yeah. which actually applies to pilots as well. I mean, a master flight instructor has 10,000 hours of it, flight time. It, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not an accident. I mean, yeah, Gladwell was really doing, he was talking about the work of Anders Eric. Anders Eric, that's right. Who's done all the pioneering research in this. And he, but he was playing a little fast. I mean, a lot of it's actually pretty close to the research, but then he wanders away at mm-hmm. times and kind of putting in his own stuff, right. which the only problem is he's not very good at differentiating between right. what's, what's actually research and, and what's glad <laughs> That's which, right. Which, so Erickson has actually just written a popular book, which, you know, you don't have to read, well, it's not reading between the lines. It's right. Really good at it. It's to, to, to correct a bunch of things. The misconception, that's right. <laughs> to undo the, yeah, yeah. unring the bell, it's, it's, the Gladwell yeah, bell. Yeah, it's called peak, uh, something about peak. Oh, right, yeah, you reference on your, yeah, in your talk. Yeah. Yes, that's and right. So, I'm meaning to but, that. but anyway, it, I mean, it's certainly 10,000, this arbitrary number of 10,000, kind of iffy, but mm-hmm. it's certainly several thousand. Yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah. And I can certainly see that, you know, just keep on, um, you know, beating this metaphor to death, but with that, with flight instruction, you know, you, you really can't encounter the different weather systems and altitude systems and air spaces around big cities and small towns, right. unless you do accumulate a lot of hours. But in the, in the teaching of physics, you know, I remember for myself, but, but, oh, sorry, go on. Break yeah. in to make a yeah. correction, uh, uh, <laughs> an important point there. Um, you talk about you can't encounter all those things, but that makes a very important point about those. Those hours have to be spent doing the right things. Mm-hmm. So if you went to always the same place with the same weather That's condition, right. you could do 10 thousand hours and you're exactly. not an expert That's, pilot. That, you know what? You have to be testing, practicing on all those different conditions. Expanding them. And, yes. Yeah, and, and so that's... You're really absolutely right. Some people say, you know... And that applies to all of these different situations. Exactly. Some people say, you know, you can't uh, you know, you can get 100 hours of flying experience, you can fly the same flight 100 times. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, and in the... In, and that was kind of also dovetailed with the, with the statement that you mean you also need feedback. It's not just enough to have accumulation. But I do feel like there was an element, you know, at least in my education, and, and, I, and I converse with some of the colleagues sitting around me yesterday. Are you talking about your flight education? Oh, no, sorry. No, my physics education. Yeah. Well, whereas, you know, when I, I, I made an analogy to, you know, like the Stephen Jay Gould, you know, punctuated equilibrium where you really kind of go from state to state in a hopping mechanism. Like when I learned what a Fourier transform is, right. then I started to see everything in terms of Fourier transforms. It wasn't like, well, I put in, you know, one hour's worth of studying on, on trigonometry and then another hour, you know, it was all of a sudden now I could see things in a whole new light and that opens up vast different areas. <laughs> So there, there seems to be two different evolutionary paths, one where you do get, get big jumps and, and mental breakthroughs. And, you know, but I think a lot of it has to be done, you know, on your own, like as well as getting feedback. I mean, the ratio is probably hard to determine how much feedback to have. But and, and you made the good point that we shouldn't waste our time, you know, teaching rote stuff, you know, that they can memorize or at least encounter before class. But uh, I wonder, you know, throughout that, I couldn't stop thinking about this notion of creativity. I mean, whether. Yeah. yeah so, go, go ahead. Okay. So. So I don't want to leave creativity. Yeah. I've given a lot of thought to that. I do want to go back to your thoughts of, of great breakthroughs. Yeah, the least. So, so this is something cognitive psychologists have studied a fair amount, and I wondered about myself. But so what their research has shown, and they and they get this actually best by looking at brain activity. Mm-hmm. Okay. And and what they see is that it, it actually isn't the it isn't truly. Uh, you know, struggle, 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 and then some great leap. Mm. Uh, what it is is it's a struggle. It's a develop, 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 and then suddenly it becomes apparent to mm. you. But the but your brain processing has still been going on to to reach that point, and you and it suddenly, you know, you it, it's kind of like you suddenly open the door, but the 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 stuff behind that door, you were actually had to have been think you know, you all that thinking about was actually was prep- prepping was wiring the brain in the right way. Ah, okay. And mm-hmm. you you sort of completed the last link, link in, to as act- it were. So so it uh, and you know I I think it's important to keep in that that in mind because it, it really says no, it's not sort of oh I'll just wait around right. for the great <laughs> right. Right. It, it, you know. It really, they come up oh, there. Your brain is actually right. <laughs> turning, it's away, turning. Or, or it has to be turning. Yeah, I yeah. see this in my kids so, too. You know, uh, see, but you, you see, I see sort of equal. 
amounts of, of linear, well, they have to practice piano, but then all of a sudden they'll look like, wow, they're really good at uh, arithmetic. And, well, they didn't spend extra time on earth. You know, it's just they, yeah. they make these cognitive kind of, and yeah. it would be great if we could tap into that, you know, seven-year-old mind every now and then and the yeah, connectivity. But, but you just have to realize it. I mean, and that sort of supports the, the you know, you get... People can get frustrated thinking, oh, I'm not really making progress, but right. you actually are, and when you have a great break with you should you should recognize, oh, that's rewarding all that effort that I right. thought was frustrating. Right. It's see, like see it's not really frustrating. It's not luck, right, yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah. So it's a preparation. So, and and I mean, but that is a problem when students are first learning when they ha- haven't had experience of really learning something that's hard mm-hmm. and uh, you know, they've been given just simple things to do, then they can very easily get discouraged because they have no idea, you know, kind of how the process works, what's right. the payoff. They don't see so, the perspective from, yeah, the, from the end you of know, it. Once they've done it a few times, but right. anyway, so that's an important thing to deal with, new college students, particularly ones with come from not very good high school. Right. So. And, and, you know, you made this point yesterday that, like, you know, there's only, there's probably some saturation point as to how many physicists a society like ours needs, you know, but, but of course, you know, our job is education. And then the question that people have is, you know, I mean, I always heard, I think it's attributed to, is it a rabbi who said, you know, something like, you know, if you're, you're paid to do research as a professor, and if you're a gentleman or a gentlewoman, you, you also put some effort into teaching. And, and then I, you know, I had, I had a conversation with my friends and I was like, well, you know, we're basically like small business people. Those of us that run labs, we have payroll, we have travel, we have a, you know, account, and then we have all the supervision stuff. We have committee things, and then and I'm like, we're like CEOs of a you know very 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 small fortune one you know one million company. And then he said, yeah, but they don't you know they don't have Tim Cook teaching forty hours a week or whatever. And it's the question of you know prioritization. And and I heard this morning just walking, I saw my colleagues down the hall feverishly debating some of the points you made yesterday. And it, it was just interesting to me because, you know, as a parent now, I have five kids. My wife and I have five kids as of a couple weeks ago. <laughs> we had twins. And, you know, I think about, like, if I spend, like, an hour on learning about parenting, you know, I feel like I'm super dad or whatever. You know, my wife is super mom. But, you know, I think it's very important that you give these talks because, you know, just spending an hour thinking about these things that we really, I mean, literally never taught me how to teach. And, and I don't know if it's different at Stanford or elsewhere. No. But, um, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, but I think it's it's so important, and and the way they, to get it right, it would be great to kind of find a way to scale the kind of. I mean, you've given your presentation elsewhere, I know, but and you have your book about this this very topic. But um, you know, then the question comes up: you know, what is our mission truly? Is it to teach the undergraduates? Is it to teach graduate students to become us? And then, well, are we just you know, you know, making you know clones of ourselves? And so that was the, the question of creativity. Um, you know, like as a physicist, I mean, a lot of what we do, and you, and you asked this question of all of us yesterday like what are the core elements of what you do and and how you characterize what you do and i had sitting next to me a theoretical biophysicist i had a particle physicist on the other side and we were you know we have very different things i'm an experimental cosmologist and we have just very different toolkits but the one thing that's hard and we talk a lot about in the arthur c clark center for human imagination is can you teach creativity and how do you do it and i remember interviewing an artist who uh, he was a a playwright and, and and an actor and he played pablo picasso in one of the plays a one man show so unbelievable Herbert Seguenza is his name and he did a phenomenal job and I asked him like well what did Pablo Picasso think about the craft of, of, of you know being an artist and then how could you apply it to being an actor and his thing was like well Pablo Picasso didn't start off with cubism I mean he started off as a classical artist and replicated the masters and I was thinking well I'm curious as to what you think I mean do you think it would be valuable to go over you talked about De Broglie yesterday I mean do you think there's a value in the historical you know teaching the the, the evidentiary, you know, final correct path of physics, but basically just repeating derivations or, I mean, how is this notion of creativity? Can you teach it? I mean, that's basically my question. Yeah. So, 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 so I, I'm not going to talk about creativity in the arts and so yeah, on, sure. but I've thought a lot about creativity in science and I've talked with people and talked with study mm-hmm. and, and, you know, and I, I can, you know, this is one of the few places I claim that Nobel might be some mm-hmm. measure of, of, of uh, competence mm-hmm. in this area. <laughs> um, and what I uh, would argue is that creative insights is it's pretty simple. It's basically where people are looking at some situation or question or problem and simply 
find a, a way of looking at it that's different than everybody else has been looking at it and realize that, that there's some other information or some other approach which is relevant to think about this and, and that way of doing it might be the science or there's some other way to solve a mathematical calculation or new ways to to understand how this describes, you know, some physical phenomena they hadn't realized before. So it's really this idea of finding a different way to look at it that's, I think, in in every case I can think of, it, it it's not bringing in something completely new. It's bringing, it's realizing that things that people already knew but didn't really didn't understand how it could apply in this situation. Mm -hmm. And so that means you sort of have to be uh, well grounded in the discipline. Like Picasso really had to know how to paint, right. how to produce images mm -hmm. with paint in a, in a very real right. way. And, you know, I get emails almost daily Me from too. people who feel they're awfully creative and not bound by all that. <laughs> background nonsense of physicists and so you know they can create infinite energy they can explain right. everything faster than and, light travel yeah, yeah. and, and uh, <laughs> where it's just nonsense mm -hmm. and so you know that's not creativity yeah <laughs> so uh yeah and you know in our in my own work i'll, I'll just give one yeah. example and both both condensation really was very clearly looking at this problem people have been trying, trying to solve this problem for a long time and recognizing that the the bottleneck, the real bottleneck they had to solve was not the bottleneck that they had been working on. And that and that if you recognize the real bottleneck was all these really cold atoms trying to get three of them together to make a molecule. And that was the process you had to suppress if you're going to make them things cold and dense enough. Okay, mm -hmm. And that led to a completely different experimental approach. But all it was was saying, oh, this problem is more important than the other mm -hmm. problems. <laughs> uh -huh. So, but you, know, you had to have some wisdom. To, it's to not very respect. brilliant, mm -hmm. but it was a. It, you needed to know about how atoms behaved at really cold temperatures, and understand that all these troubles they had originated from that process. Uh -huh. And so, so if you step back to think about this from the point of view of education, what I would argue is the standard educational approach we use in science is. It's not ineffective in teaching creativity. It's anti-effective right. in teaching creativity. And the reason I say that is that, you know, if you think about really in a normal course, students will learn, even a well-taught course, students learn all these things and they're given these tests, they're graded on, where the fundamental measure is always, are you able to produce the one answer that the instructor wants to see. Exactly. And so that's that's completely the opposite of being able to think of ways to look at things or solve problems that nobody else has done that way before. <laughs> right. And so it's really squashing, you know, you're penalized for creativity up through right. your it's entire start, school, finish. formal schooling. That's right. right. I always say when people ask what's graduate school like, I say it's definitely not like a harder version of undergraduate because yeah. an undergraduate, you may not be able to get the right answer in the homework, but somebody can, you know, somebody who's able yeah. to get, yeah. but you might not even know the question. And you mentioned this yesterday. Yeah. There might not even be a well-formed question, let alone an answer. And so how do you deal with that, um, that discomfort? Well, that's after you've passed all your graduate courses. <laughs> that's so before, a, before that, no, you have to get the one right answer. <laughs> the qual, yeah, yeah, the bane yeah. of most the classes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, you have to go through this big hurdle that says, no, you can get the answer that all the family want to see, and that that's qualifies right. you to then finally go out yeah, and, you can do it. and do things where there isn't any answer. Right. What a stupid system, right? <laughs> and of course, I mean, for much of our educations, we're, we're always, you know, we're thrown in with the, like, medical doctors. And, you know, the one thing I don't want is my doctor to, you know, take out the scalpel. So I'm going to do something really creative, <laughs> you know, so, and it has a purpose, but, but you know, but the purpose, as you say, is an, it's probably anti-effective because it was really set up, I think Ken Robinson or somebody made this point, that it was set up to train, like, people to be useful in British industry in the 1800s. Right. And, and, and that's even building upon the Bologna University model from a 
thousand years before, and and so it's just it's just really sad, you know, because I think, and and I, I know we're short on time, but I just want to finish up with, I mean, there's always this notion, and you know, I I I haven't seen that it's more pronounced than my, you know, dozens of Nobel laureates, whatever, but I have never seen somebody say, well, you know, I'm really really smart, and 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 you know, here's 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 proof about my professor at a top university, whatever, um, and so that means I can intuit all these things that you know, are my social science or or even in my English, you know, college, in the English department, you know, have to take some training to learn how to do, or even my high, kids' high school teachers have to get some training to know how to do. I think if we could crack that, you know, it's kind of the, is it bottom up, or are we really focused on the students and flipping the classrooms and going workbooks and all those wonderful things? Those definitely work. I've tried it one way, I've tried it the other way, um, but I, I feel like we need to make this breakthrough of the educators. We need to, they need to have a little bit more humility, even our colleagues in physics, that just because you're brilliant, I see this with these projects. <laughs> well, I'm trying to be. <laughs> but, but it's the same notion when I'm running an experiment. Yeah. You know, and, and I've run, I've worked for people and I've run experiments myself. And the, the notion is always, well, I'm super smart and I could be doing anything I want. And, and you know, I've, I've chosen to be an academician. Um, but, you know, obviously running a management. And I'm like, there are books written by Fortune 500 CEO, you know, like on how to be a manager. And yeah. so why not, like, take advantage? No one I know does that. We, I, you know, no one's gone to business schools to learn how to, how do you run a medium sized corporation? I think it's, I don't know, do you think it's an ego issue or? Uh, so, you know, I think it's, no, it's a culture issue. I mean, first, I know, I know enough that people go to business schools that that's not going to be the right thing, but there are certainly things that one can learn. I mean, I actually <laughs> read books on organization and mm -hmm. organizational innovation that were really pretty useful, both of any way. Oh, right. Research group, but mm -hmm. also in thinking about guiding changes in teaching. So there's, mm -hmm. there's lots of people who learn that there, there is expertise there. But you know, you also can't spend your life going out learning things. So there's a real balance of efficiency. Yes. Um, but, you know, I, I, I will say, I mean, I'll just point to the teaching things where I've looked at a lot. It doesn't take any more time to teach well mm -hmm. uh, than it does to do old traditional stuff. And in fact, new faculty spend, and we've looked at this, they spend on their first teaching, spend enormous amounts of time, much of it ill spent. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and we find it takes a several tens of hours for people to kind of, if they haven't been exposed to this, to be trained to be pretty effective. Mm -hmm. And then from then on, it, it doesn't take any more time. And that's a huge and amount of sometimes, leverage. Sometimes it takes less time. And so, if it was, if there was, the culture was just set up recognizing, no, oh, there's some expertise you need to make sure your new faculty have, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to set up, you know, training programs to make sure that that's done in a kind of most time efficient way for everybody. If people and departments um, start thought, start thinking about, let's mm -hmm. be more efficient, let's take advantage of the fact that it, it's really not necessary for every new faculty or every faculty member to reinvent the course that's right. been taught for the last 40 years, <laughs> right. uh, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and spend all that time preparing. Uh, and But that's so, you know, built into the culture right. that... You but you made the point that made, until... The uh, until the faculties, you know, recognize that they have to do it and have some metric and maybe some carrot and stick, right? Yeah. Some reward mechanism. That, that's right. And just, an, yeah, I mean, you, right now, there's there's only a stick against doing it. Yeah. And so, you know, that's a, that's a shift in the culture. So as that happens, then I think actually people will teach a lot better and they'll spend less time on it. Yeah. And I got no problems with yeah. that. So, <laughs> That's um, great. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. I know you have a huge, uh, very yeah. packed schedule today. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wyman. Okay. It's been great having you here at UCSD. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. If you enjoyed this episode of Into the Impossible, Please subscribe, comment, share, rate, and review. For a chance to win a free copy of our most recent guest's newest book, send a screenshot of your review to info at imagine.ucsd.edu. We appreciate hearing from you and are always open to your suggestions for future episodes. For more information, go to imagination.ucsd.edu. Find us on Twitter at Imagine UCSD. 
Watch us on YouTube, listen on iTunes. Into the Impossible is a production of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination in the Division of Physical Sciences at the University of California, San Diego. Eric Veery, Director. Brian Keating, Co-Director. Patrick Coleman, Associate Director. Produced by Stuart Valko.